Namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa begawato arahato sama sambuddhasa Now today I'd like to speak about vipassana meditation A uh, first point I would like to clarify is that uh, vipassana really should be taken to refer to a state of mind rather than to a specific meditation technique. There are several vipassana methods for for accessing this state of mind. They pretty well all come from Burma. This has been a strong tradition in Burma for several hundred years, the Vipassana movement. As far as we can tell, it goes back, it doesn't go that far back in time as an as a organized uh, system of meditations. The uh, Vipassana movement in Burma really began in the uh, 18th century. There's a historical link between the beginnings of the Vipassana movement and uh, British colonialism because when uh, previously under the the kingdom of uh, the Burmese kingdom the uh, sangha was under very tight hierarchical control and they kept uh, uh, the monks under very strict supervision from the center and there there was a discouragement of experimentation with new new uh, techniques new methods of meditation but when the british occupied part of Burma, the monks living in that part of Burma were no longer under the effective control of the Sangha hierarchy, and the British really didn't care what they did, so they were more free to experiment. And the Vipassana traditions that we know of today all began in the late 18th, early 19th century. There are several, actually quite a few, traditions of Vipassana meditation that came out of Burma. The ones that come outside of Burma into um, other countries are fewer in number. There's the uh, Mahasi tradition, the Goenka tradition, Pa'ak tradition. These are all Vipassana methods that came out of Burma and became established in other countries, including Western countries, and also in the uh, other Theravada countries, like Sri Lanka and Thailand, they, they've made some, some impact. The particular method that I was trained in, this is actually how I started meditating, I guess it's getting close to 40 years ago now, was the Mahasi method. It's named after the monk Mahasi Sayadaw, who lived in the first half of the 20th century. And so that's what I'll be um, focusing on in this talk, because it's the only method I, I really feel competent to talk on in any detail. As I said, we should uh, think of Vipassana as a state of mind. It means something like clear seeing. And it means uh, uh, that the mind is observing the objects of consciousness clearly in a dispassionate way, without attachment, without judgment or discrimination, without picking and choosing, just simply being aware of what presents itself to consciousness at each moment. And if this state of mind is found and is persevered in, then naturally the um, objects of consciousness become clear to the mind and reveal themselves to be uh, imbued with the three characteristics of uh, emptiness, suffering, and impermanence the three universal characteristics, the tilakana. 
normally we don't see things in this way because our minds are caught up with uh, picking and choosing, with liking and disliking, with being afraid or being fascinated. And we get caught up in the objects and we identify with the objects. But we're trying, to, practicing Vipassana, we're trying to step back and just clearly see without coloring it by any kind of preferences or self-view, just seeing what is the object of consciousness at this moment. Now, a, um, there are many difficulties or obstacles to really accessing the state of mind, and one of them is the kind of fuzziness of, uh, of consciousness. Some people try to practice uh, what's sometimes called choiceless awareness, of just being aware of the contents of consciousness without any particular formal method. And the problem with this is that it lacks specificity. The objects are, are not seen crisply and clearly in their own nature. Uh, we're trying to see things as they are with a very precise focus. What is this object now? There is a um, mental state that's essential for doing this. It's a, it's a particular form of equanimity called Tatra Majatata. And it's been translated as specific neutrality, a literal breakdown of the word would give us being in the middle about that. Tatra is that, and it's an emphatic that. It's like this specific thing. And majata means being in the middle. So not being swayed from one side to the other, to liking or disliking, from fear or fascination. Just being very clear and precise what is this object, this particular object here right now? And I think this quality is the particular strength of the Mahasi method, which emphasizes that particularity, that precision of noting that I think is, is uh, can be missing from uh, a more informal approach. So I'll speak now about the particular method that's known as the Mahasi method. Sometimes you'll hear it called the noting method. The uh, meditator should, in the sitting posture, should begin this, the, the session by observing the movement of the abdomen as we breathe, the rising and falling of the belly as, as, as we breathe. And this is taken as a broad object it's not a point, it's the entire bowl of the, the abdomen is noticed rising and falling. And this is so we don't get too, too much concentration. We have a, a broad brush. You know? So we watch that, being aware of that physical process for anywhere from a few breaths to a few minutes until the mind feels settled and, and centered. And then you make a subtle shift in the mind and be aware of whatever arises to consciousness, whether it's an internal object like a thought or a memory or a, a daydream, or whether it's an external object like a sound, a smell, or a sensation elsewhere in the body. And the uh, special practice of the Mahasi method is to make a mental note of the object. Now, this is done very lightly and subliminally and quickly. You just put a label or a note on the object as, uh, for example, remembering or hearing or feeling pain. You know, feeling cold, feeling hot, you know, just just like that. 
now a few things about this uh, this technique of of noting. First of all, don't get caught up with it. Don't waste any time trying to decide what is the correct note. The noting is really secondary. The, the important thing is that you have seen the object clearly. The noting is just a way of making sure you have done that and you're being specific. So it's kind of a little trick you're playing on yourself. You to you just make sure you've seen that that object. If you've seen it clearly, you're able to put a label on it. So the, there's no really such thing as correct or incorrect labeling, but uh, there are s some guidelines that make it more helpful. The label should be very short, one or two words, and try to use verbs rather than nouns so that it's hearing rather than sound. You know, uh, thinking rather than thought. And I would also suggest you try, with the mental objects, you try and distinguish clearly between thoughts of past and future. So remembering or speculating or worrying rather than just lump everything together as thinking. And it's particularly important very uh, very useful if you notice intentions and any intention that arises in the mind uh, to begin with coarse intentions of movement of the body like if you feel you need to shift your posture you should never just shift your your leg or your arm but you should first notice discomfort then you notice intention to move and then you notice moving so the intention is is very important there are some more subtle physical intentions there's the intention to swallow <laughs> periodically our mouths uh, fill with saliva and we swallow and you should notice that discomfort and then notice the intention to swallow before you swallow there's an even more subtle physical intention that if you have your eyes open, for example, when you're walking, if you notice the intention to blink, now you're getting to a very subtle, very refined level of noticing if you notice the intention to blink before you blink. But there's even um, a subtler intention than that. There is intention connected with thought. And you can notice the intention to think before you think. You can feel the mind kind of moving towards a thought which does not at this point have any content, but you can feel the mind sort of coming together, gathering for a thought. And if you notice that intention clearly at that point, the thought will be terminated it won't complete itself so the mind can become very very quiet you can be experience an extremely quiet mind with occasional intention to think in the normal course of things you'll find yourself naturally cycling between a state where the mind seems very busy and you're doing quite a lot of noticing and a state where the mind is very, very quiet. There doesn't seem to be anything to notice. And then at that point, you should avoid trying to search around or fabricate things to notice. You just go back to noticing the bodily sensation of breathing until the mind becomes busy again. And you'll cycle in and out of those two states. So the breath at your belly is kind of your home base. It's not an object you focus on it exclusively like in, in a samadhi meditation, but it's a place you, you rest. You go back there when the mind is quiet and, and stay there until there's something to notice. There's a, a, a good rule of thumb or principle to remember at all times when you're doing this practice is whatever arises in the mind should be treated 
the same. So the way uh, it can be phrased is nothing is so trivial that it can be ignored and nothing is so important that it needs to be held on to. This is really the challenge because some content that arises to the mind might have some emotional resonance and we get caught in it. Some memory that, that seems meaningful to us or, or some uh, concern about the future, we get caught in that. We should try try to notice everything with that same level of intention and try and notice things very specifically so you break things up. If there's, you know, if it, taking this example, say an old memory comes up that has some strong emotional attachment to for you, the content of the memory is one thing, the emotional reaction is another, any sensation in the body is another, and so on. Don't just lump it all together. Notice specific components. In uh, walking meditation, the same practice is carried on, but here, instead of using the breath as the home object, we use the sensation on the soles of the feet as we walk very slowly backwards and forwards. Can also do this, uh, carry this on in various activities, like you're making yourself a cup of tea or sweeping the floor. You try and be aware of the motions of the body and any uh, thoughts or feelings that arise. So. This can be carried on in activity as well, although the, the most intensive form is when you're sitting or walking. There is a whole uh, literature on the, um, the stages that the meditator goes through in pursuing this practice. This has its origins in a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Relay Coach Sutta, where various states of mind are described like a relay coach. A relay coach is a way of a fast movement in, in ancient times. They would have, for like royal messengers, they would have stations set up every so many miles and you would be able to drive your horse very fast and then you get to the station, you change horses. So these stages are compared to, to posts on the relay road. But this sutta is quite, as many times we find in the, in the, the sutta pitaka, the sutta is very concise and there's no real description of these stages. The Sudhimaga, which is a meditation manual written by Buddha Gosa about a thousand years after the Buddha and is a very important formative text in the Theravada tradition, the whole text of the Vasudhimaga, which runs to some 900 pages, is framed around this, uh, this Relay Coach Sutta, going through these uh, various stages. And a very good modern treatment of these stages is found in the writings of Mahasi Sayadaw, particularly uh, his book, The Progress of Insight, which details the stages the mind goes through. I won't uh, go through this whole subject in great detail, but I'll kind of touch on some of the highlights here. After the, uh, the mind has gained some clarity and insight, it's then possible that various experiences will occur and these are mostly of a, at this stage, are mostly of a kind of pleasant nature, like seeing, and the ones that are listed are like seeing bright light or uh, feeling thrills in the body, feeling an uh, outpouring of faith. And these are all sort of jonic type experiences and 
in the insight path, they're called the 10 corruptions of insight. This is the first signpost uh, where many meditators at this point believe they've attained to uh, enlightenment. This is a common mistake if they if they don't have proper learning or the or guidance because it feels very powerful and the advice is not to get too interested or attached to any of these phenomena but just notice them clearly one of my teachers said it doesn't matter whether it's an airplane crashing in the yard or an itchy bum or visions of the Brahma gods in their palaces. It's just an object. Just notice the object and carry on. So uh, if one can practice in this way and just clearly notice the object as it arises, you pass through this stage and the next stage is called knowledge of what is path and what is not path. And it's said that the real meditation only begins at that point. Yeah. And then all these phenomena fade away. And again, if the meditator doesn't really understand the process, they can think their meditation's lost, it's not going right, but it actually is progression. They are actually, they've gone through that those 10 corruptions and their, their mind is now operating on a different level. And uh, as this goes on, the next real, and there are several kind of intermediate subtleties, but the mind eventually comes to seeing clearly the nature of samsara, seeing impermanence and uh, suffering and the emptiness of things. And this can be daunting. It can be challenging for the meditator, because it's like taking off your rose-colored glasses and you're looking at reality naked and its own nature as it actually is for the first time. And you realize there's nothing to depend on. Everything is impermanent. Everything's falling away. And this can lead to a fear. This can lead to sadness. You know, it, it, it can be a difficult, uh, a difficult passage. But if the meditator has courage and determination and just carries on through, you eventually come out the other side of that and reach the stage that's called equanimity about formations. So this is now a state of mind that's very solidly based on equanimity. You've seen through the nature of samsara, but you haven't yet seen what's beyond, but you're at peace. And this stage is in itself a, a, a great blessing. Um, you feel completely at ease. There's no difficulty or sense of striving or effort. You know, but the meditation is flawless. Everything that arises is clearly seen without making any particular effort to do so. So you're not even really, strictly speaking, meditating at that point because you're not doing anything. You're just sitting there. You're just being. But everything is crystal clear. So this is not yet awakening, but we could say it's the launching pad. This is the only place from which enlightenment can happen but there's nothing you can do to make it happen Vasudhi Maga has um, what I think is a very beautiful simile for this state it talks about mariners at sea in ancient times they would carry a bird in a cage on the ship, the land-finding crow. And when they thought they might be close to land, they would release the bird and watch which way it flew 
they would fly off to the north, say, and then they'd wait. And if the bird came back, it meant it didn't find any land. Then it would rest for a while, then it would fly off again to the east. And then if it came back, they knew there's no land in that direction. And eventually the bird didn't come back, and they'd know that they were close to shore in that direction. And Buddha Gosa says the mind is like that in the equanimity about formations. It goes out seeking the far shore, and often it doesn't find it, it just comes back. But eventually, as the, in the words of Buddha Gosa, the mind does that which it has not done since beginningless time and alights upon non-occurrence. So it arrives at the unconditioned. Samsara is, in, uh, in essence, is something that we do. It's not a, a place or a state. It's, it's a choice. It's something we're doing moment by moment. And when the mind just stops doing that, then we realize nibbana. Getting back to the equanimity about formations, Mahasi Sayada says that the meditator will only be able to remain in that state for maybe a few hours, maybe four hours or so. And then if enlightenment is not attained, the mind will fall back to a stage called a reobservation. And um, at that stage, there's a feeling of restlessness. So you know you've lost equanimity. You start to feel restless. And the way to get back is to be, uh, make a real effort to be still, you know, and to kind of push through that restlessness. And you can get back to equanimity. So you'll go in and out of that until nibbana is realized. And Mahasi is basing that on experience of teaching thousands of people observing their their mental states and i would say from my much more limited experience that this is uh this is so that people only seem to be able to hold this state for a few hours and you go in and out of it so this is um a brief summary of how you know how the stages of insight work uh, the source to, to read, if you want a more detailed account, is Mahasi Sayadaw, Progress of Insight. And this um, Vipassana practice, Vipassana practice in general, and Mahasi Sayadaw tradition is one of them, is meant to develop this clear seeing so that you can see through the nature of samsara and end up reaching disenchantment, dispassion, and liberation by overcoming the tendency of the mind to fall into either fear or fascination. We can see things clearly and the phenomena become less engaging to the mind. It's like you, you're you playing this game in samsara of the mind wanting to take an object to satisfy or complete itself. It takes the object and then the object disappoints because it's impermanent, suffering, and, and empty. But then the mind immediately, the hunger re-arises and the mind seeks out for the next object. And when we're doing vipassana meditation, we're still following that same practice we're still chasing after objects but we're now we're trying to make it more conscious and we're trying to see and understand the nature of the process and when the process is seen clearly then the energy goes out of samsara this is the um, disenchantment and dispassion it takes the energy of the mind jumping for an object, it takes that away, it diminishes it. And then eventually the mind will just stop doing that. And it does it kind of a, metaphorically, it does a sort of leap sideways and it alights upon the unconditioned. So this, uh, this is the 
the practice that um, leads to realization of nibbana. It's a it's a difficult practice, and it's uh, recommended strongly that you have a solid base in samadhi before you undertake that practice because that'll make it smoother and easier. If the, the mind is completely untrained and you try and observe the phenomena, it, it's very difficult. And it can be quite uh, disorienting. I've seen it before more than once that um, someone who's a complete beginner tries to undertake serious practice and do vipassana and after three or four days they come and tell me Ajahn I, I think I'm going crazy I think I'm losing my mind and I ask them well, what's happening and they say oh my thoughts are just all over the place I just can't. my mind is just this complete jumble I try and calm them down and I say you know that's your mind has been like that forever it's just now you're just noticing it for the first time uh, one woman had a really good image that I think it, you know describes this kind of untrained mind. She said, it's like I'm sitting in my kuti and there's four or five radios and they're all fading in and out from different stations and some of them are static and some of them are music and some of them are talk and they're fading in and out and it's all going all at once. But you just persist you just clearly notice the objects the mind does become very quiet and you can notice things on a much more refined and precise level sometimes if the mind is does in that fall into that very confused state all you can do is just keep noticing confusion confusion you know and at least that little moment of clarity just kind of cutting through that can begin to diminish it So, you know, before I finish, I'll just say something about um, the traditional way of practice in the Mahasi's method in in, in uh, Burma was very strict. Meditators would do uh, a session of maybe uh, two weeks or up to three months, and the practice was to do formal meditation 20 hours a day, sleep for four, and there's um, practice set out for for eating as well. So it's not a break when the meal time comes. You know, you have a practice of how you eat, which is you notice you eat very slowly, and you notice you know lifting the spoon, tasting, swallowing, and so on. So you don't break your practice for that. And Mahasi's idea was that you want to develop a continuity. You want to have an unbroken mindfulness. And he said it's like uh, trying to make a fire by rubbing two sticks together. If you stop rubbing the sticks every time you get a bit tired, you'll never get a spark. So, and as I said at the outset, there are other methods of doing vipassana. Uh, and uh, you know, I think they're all really skillful means of trying to access the state of mind of clear seeing. You know, and that's what we're really trying to go for is to have this clear, specific noticing of, of discrete objects, one after the other, and to see the uh, three characteristics in each object so that then there's a diminishment in the mind of grasping and clinging and desire and uh, disenchantment and dispassion can arise.